book two chapter six of the wanderer's necklace by h rider haggard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six heliodore that night there was feasting at the palace and i olaf now known as michael as a convert was one of the chief guests so that for me there was no escape i sat very silent so silent that the augusta frowned though she was too far off to speak to me the banquet came to an end at last and before midnight i was free to go still without word from the empress who withdrew herself as i thought in an ill humour i sought my bed but in it knew little of sleep i had found her for whom during all the long years i had been searching though i did not understand that i was searching after the ages i had found her and she had found me her eyes said it and unless i dreamed her sweet voice said it also who was she doubtless that heliodore daughter of magus the prince of whom the bishop barnabas had spoken to me oh now i understood what he meant when he spoke of another necklace like to that i wore and yet would explain nothing it lay upon the breast of heliodore heliodore who was such a one as he wished that i might wed well certainly i wished it too but alas how could i wed who was in irene's power a toy for her to play with or to break and how would it fare with any woman whom it was known that i wished to wed i must be secret until she was gone from constantinople and in this way or in that i could follow her i who had ever been open-minded must learn to keep my own counsel now too i remembered how barnabas had said the augusta commanded that this prince magus and his daughter should come to the palace as her guests while the place was vast a town in itself and likely enough i should not see them there yet i longed to see one of them as never i had longed for anything before i was sure also that no fears could keep us apart even though i knew the road before me to be full of dangers and of trials knew that i went with my life in my hand the life of which i had been quite careless but that now had become so dear to me for did not the world hold another to whom it belonged the night passed away i rose and went about my morning duties scarcely were these finished when a messenger summoned me to the presence of the augusta i followed him with a sinking heart certain that those woes which i had foreseen were about to begin also now there was no woman in the whole world whom i less wished to see than irene empress of the earth i was led to the small audience chamber whereof i have already spoken that on the floor of which was the mosaic of the goddess venus making pretence to kill her lover there i found the augusta seated in a chair of state the minister staratius my godfather who glowered at me as i entered some secretaries and martina my godmother who was the lady in attendance i saluted the empress who bowed graciously and said general olaf nay i forgot general michael your godfather staratius has something to say which i trust will please you as much as it does him and me speak staratius beloved godson began staratius in a voice of sullen rage it has pleased the augusta to appoint you on the prayer and advice of me staratius interrupted the empress on the prayer and advice of me staratius repeated the eunuch like a talking bird to be one of her chamberlains and master of the palace at a salary of i forget the sum but it was a great one with all the power and prerequisites to that office pertaining in reward of the services which you have rendered to her and the empire thank the empress for her gracious favour 
Nay, interrupted Irene again, thank your beloved godfather Staratius, who has given me no peace until I offered you this preferment, which has suddenly become vacant. Staratius alone knows why, for I do not. Oh, you were wise, Olaf, I mean Michael, to choose Staratius for a godfather, though I warn him, she added archly that in his natural love he must not push you forward too fast, lest others should begin to show that jealousy which is a stranger to his noble nature. Come hither, Michael, and kiss my hand upon your appointment. So I advanced, and kneeling, kissed the Augusta's hand, according to custom on such occasions, noting, as doubtless Staratius did also, that she pressed it hard enough against my lips. Then I rose and said, I thank thee, Augusta. And my godfather Staratius, she interrupted. And my godfather Staratius, I echoed, for her and his goodness towards me. Yet with humility I venture to say that I am a soldier who knows nothing whatsoever of the duties of a chamberlain and of a master of the palace and therefore I beg that someone else more competent may be chosen to fill these high offices. On hearing these words, Staratius stared at me with his round and owl-like eyes. Never before had he known an officer in Constantinople who wished to decline power and more pay. Scarcely, indeed, could he believe his ears, but the Augusta only laughed baptism has not changed you olaf she said whoever were simple as i believe your duties will be at any rate your godfather and godmother will instruct you in them especially your godmother so no more of such foolish talk staratius you may be gone to attend to the affairs of which we have been speaking as i see you burn to do and take those secretaries with you for the scratching of their pens sets my teeth on edge bide here a moment general for as master of the palace it will be your duty to receive certain guests to-day of whom i wish to speak with you bide you also martina that you may remember my words in case this unpractised officer should forget them Storatius and his secretaries bowed themselves out leaving the three of us alone now olaf or michael which do you wish to be called it is more easy for a man to alter his nature than his name i answered have you altered your nature if so your manners remain much what they were well then be olaf in private and michael in public for often an alias is convenient enough hark i would read you a lesson as the wise king solomon said everything has its place and time it is good to repent you of your sins and to think about your soul but i pray you do so no more at my feasts especially when they are given in your honour last night you sat at the board like a mummy at an egyptian banquet had your skull stood on it filled with wine it could scarce have looked grimmer than did your face be more cheerful i pray you or i will have you tonsured and promoted to be a bishop like that old heretic barnabas of whom you are so fond ah you smile at last and i am glad to see it now hearken again this afternoon there comes to the palace a certain old egyptian named magas whom i place in your especial charge and with him his wife at least i think she is his wife nay mistress his daughter interrupted martina oh his daughter said the augusta suspiciously i did not know she was his daughter what is she like martina i have not seen her empress but someone said that she is a black-looking woman such as the nile breeds is it so then i charge you olaf keep her far from me for i love not these ugly black women whose woolly hair always smells of grease yes i give you leave to court her if you will since thereby you may learn some secrets and she laughed merrily i bowed saying that i would obey the augustus orders to the best of my power 
and she went on. Olaf, I would discover the truth concerning this Magus and his schemes, which, as a soldier, you are well fitted to find out. It seems he has a plan for the recovery of Egypt out of the hands of the followers of that accursed false prophet whose soul dwells with Satan. Now I would win back Egypt, if I may, and thereby add glory to my name and the empire. Hear all that he proposes, study it well, and make report to me. Afterwards I will see him alone, who for the present will send him a letter by the hand of Martina here, bidding him open all his heart to you. For a week or more I shall have no time to spend upon this magus, who must give myself to business upon which hangs my power and perchance my life. These words she spoke heavily, then fell into a fit of brooding. Rousing herself, she went on. Did you note yesterday, Olaf, if you had any mind left for the things of earth, that as I drove in state through the streets many met me with sullen silence, while others cursed me openly and shouted, Where is the Augustus? Give us Constantine. We will have no woman's rule. I saw and heard some of these things, Augusta. Also that certain of the soldiers on guard in the city had a mutinous air. Ay, but what you did not see and hear was that a plot had been laid to murder me in the cathedral. I got wind of it in time, and if you were still governor of yonder prison, you'd know where the murderers are today. Yet they're but tools. It is their captains whom I want. While well, torture may make them speak, Staratius has gone to see to it. Oh, the strife is fierce and doubtful. I walk blindfold along a precipice. Above are fortune's heights, and beneath black ruin. Perhaps you'd be wise to get you to Constantine, Olaf, and become his man, as many are doing, since he'd be glad of you. No need to shake your head, for that's not your way. You are no hound to bite the hand that feeds you, like these street-bred dogs. Would that I could keep you nearer to me, where hour by hour you might help me with your counsel and your quiet strength. But it may not be as yet. I raise you as high as I dare, but it must be done step by step, for even now some grow jealous. Take heed to what you eat, Olaf. See that your guards are northmen, and beneath your doublet wear mail, especially at night. Moreover, unless I send for you, do not come near me too often, and when we meet, be my humble servant like others. Eh, learn to crawl and kiss the ground. Above all, keep secret as the grave. Now, she went on after a pause, during which I stood silent, what is there more? Oh, with your new offices you'll retain that of captain of my guard, for I would be well watched during these next few weeks. Follow up the matter of the Egyptian. You may find advancement in it. Perchance one day you will be the general I send against the Muslims, if I can spare you. On all this matter be secret also, for once rumor buzzes over it, that peach rots. The Egyptian and his swarthy girl come to the palace today, when he will receive my letter. Meet him and see them well housed, though not too near me. Martina will help you. Now be gone, and leave me to my battles. So I went, and she watched me to the door with eyes that were full of tenderness. Again there was a blank in my memory, or my vision. I suppose that Magus and his daughter Heliodore arrived at the palace on the day of my interview with Irene, of which I have told. I suppose that I welcomed them and conducted them to the guest house that had been made ready for them in the gardens. Doubtless, I listened eagerly to the first words which Heliodore spoke to me, save that one in the cathedral, the word of greeting. Doubtless, I asked her many things, and she gave me many answers, but of all this nothing remains. What comes back to me is a picture of the Egyptian prince, Magus, and myself seated at some meal in a chamber overlooking the moonlit palace garden. We were alone, 
and this noble white-bearded man hook-nosed and hawk-eyed was telling me of the troubles of his countrymen the christian copse of egypt look on me sir he said as i could prove to you word worth while and as many could bear witness for the records have been kept i am a descendant in the true line from the ancient pharaohs of my country moreover my daughter through her grecian mother is sprung from the ptolemies our race is christian and has been for these three hundred years although it was among the last to be converted yet noble as we are we suffer every wrong at the hands of the moslems our goods and lands are doubly taxed and if we should go into the towns of lower egypt we must wear garments on which the cross is broidered as a badge of shame yet where i live near to the first cataract of the nile and not so very far from the city of old thebes the prophet worshippers have no real power i am still the true ruler of that district as the bishop barnabas will tell you and at any moment were my standard to be lifted i could call three thousand coptic spears to fight for christ and egypt moreover if money were forthcoming the hosts of nubia could be raised and together we might sweep down on the moslems like the nile in flood and drive them back to alexandria then he went on to set out his plans which in some were that a roman fleet and army should appear at the mouths of the nile to besiege and capture alexandria and with his help massacre or drive out every moslem in egypt the scheme which he set forth with much detail seemed feasible enough and when i had mastered its particulars i promised to report it to the empress and afterwards to speak with him further i left the chamber and presently stood in the garden although it was autumn time the night in this mild climate was very warm and pleasant and the moonlight threw black shadows of the trees across the paths under one of these trees an ancient green-leaved oak the largest of a little grove i saw a woman sitting perchance i knew who she was perchance i had come thither to meet her i cannot say at least this was not our first meeting by many for as i came she rose lifting her flower-like face towards my own and the next moment was in my arms when we had kissed our full we began to talk seated hand in hand beneath the oak what have you been doing this day beloved she asked much would i do every day heliodore i have attended to my duties which are threefold as chamberlain as master of the palace and as captain of the guard also for a little while i saw the augusta to whom i had to report various matters the interview was brief since a rumour had reached her that the armenian regiments refused to take the oath of fidelity to her alone as she has commanded should be done and demand that the name of the emperor her son should be coupled with hers as before this report disturbed her much so that she had little time for other business did you speak of my father's matter olaf ay shortly she listened and asked whether i was sure that i had got the truth from him she added that i had best test it by what i could win from you by any arts that a man may use for heliodore because of something that my godmother martina said to her it is fixed in her mind that you are black-skinned and very ugly therefore the augusta who does not like any man about her to care for other women thinks i may make love to you with safety so i prayed for leave for my duties on the guard this evening that i might sup with your father in the guest-house and see what i could learn from one or both of you love makes you clever olaf but hearken i do not believe that the empress thinks me black and ugly any longer as it chanced while i walked in the inner garden this afternoon where you said i might go when i wished to be quite alone dreaming of our love and you i looked up and saw an imperial woman of middle age who was gorgeous as a peacock watching me from a little distance 
I went on my way, pretending to see no one, and heard the lady say, "'Has all this trouble driven me mad, Martina? "'Or did I behold a woman beautiful as one of the nymphs of my people's fables, "'wandering yonder among those bushes?' I repeat her very words, Olaf, not because they are true, for remember, she saw me at a distance, and against a background of rocks and autumn flowers, but because they were her words, which I think you ought to hear, were those that followed them. Irene has said many false things in her life, I said, smiling, but by all the saints, these were not among them. Then we embraced again, and after that was finished, Heliodore, her head resting on my shoulder, continued her story. "'What was she like, mistress?' asked the Lady Martina, for by this time I had passed behind some little trees. "'I have seen no one who is beautiful in this garden except yourself.' "'She was clad in a clinging white robe, Martina, that left her arms and bosom bare. "'Being alone,' "'Olaf, I wore my Egyptian dress beneath my cloak, "'which I had laid down because of the heat of the sun. "'She was not so very tall, yet rounded and most graceful. "'Her eyes seemed large and dark, Martina, like her hair. "'Her face was tinted like a rich-hued rose. "'Ooh, were I a man, she seemed such a one as I should love, "'who, like all my people, have ever worshipped beauty. "'Yet what I did say that she put me in mind of a nymph of greece nay that was not so it was of a goddess of old egypt that she put me in mind for on her face was the dreaming smile which i have seen on that statue of mother isis whom the egyptians worshipped moreover she wore just such a headdress as i have noted upon those statues now the lady martina answered surely you must have dreamed mistress the only Egyptian woman in the palace is the daughter of the old Coptic noble Magus, who is in Olaf's charge. And though I am told that she is not so ugly as I heard at first, Olaf has never said to me that she was like a goddess. What you saw was doubtless some image of fortune conjured up by your mind. This I take to be the best of omens, who in these doubtful days grows superstitious." Would Olaf tell one woman that another was like a goddess, Martina? Even though she to whom he spoke was his godmother, and a dozen years younger than himself? Come, she added, and let us see if we can find this Egyptian. Then, Heliodore went on, not knowing what to do, I stood still there against the rockwork and the flowers, till presently, round the bushes, appeared the splendid lady and Martina, now when i olaf heard all this i groaned and said oh heliodore it was the augusta herself yes it was the augusta as i learned presently well they came and i curtsied to them are you the daughter of magus the egyptian asked the lady eyeing me from head to foot yes madam i answered i am heliodore the daughter of magus I pray that I have done no wrong in walking in this garden, but the General Olaf, the master of the palace, gave me leave to come here. And did the General Olaf, whom we know as Michael, give you that necklace which you wear also, O daughter of Magus? Nay, you must needs answer me, for I am the Augusta. Now I curtsied again and said, Not so, O Augusta, the necklace is from old Egypt and was found upon the body of a royal lady in a tomb. I have worn it for many years. Indeed, and that which the General Michael wears came also from a tomb. Yes, he told me so, Augusta, I said. It would seem that the two must once have been one, daughter of Magus. It may be so, Augusta, I do not know. Now the Empress looked about her and the Lady Martina, dropping behind, began to fan herself. "'Are you married, girl?' she asked. "'No,' I answered. "'Are you affianced?' Now I hesitated a little, then answered no again. "'You seem to be somewhat doubtful on the point. 
farewell for this while when you walk abroad in our garden which is open to you be pleased to array yourself in the dress of our country and not in that of a courtesan of egypt what did you answer to that saying i asked that which was not wise i fear olaf for my temper stirred me i answered madam i thank you for your permission to walk in your garden if ever i should do so again as your guest be sure that i will not wear garments which before byzantium was a village were sacred to the gods of my country and those of my ancestors the queens of egypt and then i asked the empress answered well spoken such would have been my own words had i been in your place moreover they are true and the robe becomes you well yet presume not too far girl seeing that byzantium is no longer a village and egypt has some fanatic moslem for a pharaoh who thinks little of your ancient blood so i bowed and went and as i walked away heard the empress rating the lady martina about i know not what save that your name came into the matter and my own why does this empress talk so much about you olaf seeing that she has many officers who are higher in her service and why was she so moved about this matter of the necklace of golden shells heliodore i answered i must tell you now what i have hidden from you the augusta has been pleased why i cannot say but chiefly i suppose because of late years it has been my fancy to keep myself apart from women which is rare in this land to show me certain favour i gather even that whether she means it or means it not she has thought of me as a husband oh interrupted heliodore starting away from me now i understand everything and pray have you thought as a wife of her who has been a widow these ten years and has a son of twenty god above us alone knows what i have or have not thought but it is certain that at present i think of her only as one who has been most kind to me but who is more to be feared than my worst foe if i have any hush she said raising her finger i fancied i heard someone stir behind us fear nothing i answered we are alone here for i set guards of my own company around the place with command to admit no one and my order runs against all save the empress in person then we are safe olaf since this damp would disarrange her hair which i noticed is curled with irons not by nature like my own oh olaf olaf how wonderful is fate that has brought us together i say that when i saw you yonder in the cathedral for the first time since i was born i knew you again as you knew me that is why when you whispered to me greetings after the ages i gave you back your welcome i know nothing of the past if we lived in love before that tale is lost to me but there's your dream and there's the necklace when i was a child olaf it was taken from the embalmed body of some royal woman who by tradition was of my own race yes and by records of which my father can tell you for he is among the last who can still read the writing of the old egyptians moreover she was very like me olaf for i remember her well as she lay in her coffin preserved by arts which the egyptians had she was young not much older than i am to-day and her story tells that she died in giving birth to a son who grew up a strong and vigorous man and although he was but half royal founded a new dynasty in egypt and became my forefather this necklace lay upon her breast and beneath it a writing on papyrus which said that when the half of it which was lost should be joined again to that half then those who had worn them would meet once more as mortals now the two halves of the necklace have met and we have met as god decreed and it is one and we are one for ever and for ever let every empress of the earth do what they will to part us 
Ay, I answered, embracing her again. We are one for ever and for ever, though perchance for a while we may be separated from time to time. End of chapter 6 Book 2, Chapter 7 of The Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Victory or Valhalla A minute later, I heard a rustle as of branches being moved by people thrusting their way through them. A choked voice commanded, Take him, living or dead. Armed men appeared about us, four of them, and one cried, Yield! I sprang up and drew the wanderer's sword. Who orders the General Michael to yield in his own command? I asked. I do, answered the man. Yield or die. Now, thinking that these were robbers or murderers hired by some enemy, I sprang at him. Nor was that battle long, for at my first stroke he fell dead. Then the other three set on me. But I wore mail beneath my doublet, as Irene had bade me do, and their swords glanced. Moreover, the old northern rage entered into me, and these easterners were no match for my skill and strength. First one, then another of them went down, whereon the third fled away, taking with him a grisly wound behind, for I struck him as he fled. "'Now it seems there is an end of that,' I gasped to Heliodor, who was crouched upon the seat. "'Come, let me take you to your father and summon my guards, ere we meet more of these murderers.' As I spoke, a cloaked and hooded woman glided from the shelter of the trees, behind, and stood before us. She threw back the hood from her head, and the moonlight fell upon her face. It was that of the Empress, but, oh, so changed by jealous rage that I should scarce have known her. The large eyes seemed to flash fire, the cheeks were white, save where they had been touched with paint, the lips trembled. Twice she tried to speak and failed, but at the third effort words came. Nay, all is but begun, she said in a voice that was full of hate. "'Know that I have heard your every word. "'So, traitor, you would tell my secrets to this Egyptian slut "'and then murder my own servants?' "'And she pointed to the dead and wounded men. "'Well, you shall pay for it, both of you, I swear.' "'Is it murder, Augusta?' I asked, saluting, "'when four assail one man, and thinking them assassins, "'he fights for his life and wins the fray? "'What are four such curs against you?' I should have brought a dozen. Yet it was at me you struck. Whate'er they did, I ordered them to do. Had I known it, Augusta, I would never have drawn sword, who am your officer and obedient to the end. Nay, you'd stab me with your tongue, not with your sword, she answered, with something like a sob. You say you are my obedient officer. Well, now we will see. "'Smite me that bold-faced baggage dead, or smite me dead. "'I care not which. "'Then fall upon your sword. "'The first I cannot do, Augusta, "'for it would be murder against one who has done no wrong, "'and I will not stain my soul with murder. "'Done no wrong? "'Has she not mocked me, my years, my widowhood, "'yes, and even my hair, in the pride of her, her youth, me?' the empress of the world now heliodore spoke for the first time and has not the empress of the world called a poor maid of blood as noble as her own by shameful names she asked for the second i went on before irene could answer i cannot do that either for it would be foul treason as well as murder to lift my sword against your anointed majesty but as for the third as is my duty that i will do or rather suffer your servants to do, if it pleases you to repeat the order later when you are calm. What? cried Heliodore. Would you go and leave me here? Then, Olaf, by the gods of my forefathers, worshipped for ten thousand years, 
and by the gods I worship, I'll find a means to follow you within an hour. Oh, Empress of the world, there is another world you do not rule, and there we'll call you to account. Now Irene stared at Heliodor, and Heliodor stared back at her, and the sight was very strange. At least you have spirit, girl, but think not that shall save you, for there's no room for both of us on earth. If I go, it may prove wide enough, Augusta, I broke in. Nay, you shall not go, Olaf, at least not yet. My orders are that you do not fall upon your sword. As for this Egyptian witch, well, presently my people will be here, then we will see. Now I drew Heliodor to the trunk of the great tree which stood near by and set myself in front of her. What are you about to do? asked the Empress. I am about to fight your eastern curs until I fall, for no northern man will lift a sword against me, even on your orders, Augusta. When I am down, this lady must play her own part as God shall guide her. Have no fear, Olaf, Heliodor said gently. I wear a dagger. Scarcely had she spoken when there was a sound of many feet. The man whom I had wounded had run shouting towards the palace, rousing the soldiers, both those on watch and those in their quarters. Now these began to arrive and to gather in the glade before the clump of trees, for some guards who had heard the clash of arms guided them to the place. They were of all races and sundry regiments, Greeks, Byzantines, Bulgars, Armenians, so-called Romans, and with them a number of Britons and Northmen. Seeing the Empress, and nearby, myself standing with drawn sword against the tree, sheltering the Lady Heliodore, also on the ground, those whom I had cut down, they halted. One of their officers asked what they must do. "'Kill me that man who has slain my servants, or stay, take him living!' screamed the Augusta. Now among those who had gathered was a certain lieutenant of my own, a blue-eyed, flaxen-haired Norwegian giant of the name of Jode. This man loved me like a brother, I believe because once it had been my fortune to save his life. Also often I had proved his friend when he was in trouble, for in those days Jode got drunk at times, and when he was drunk lost money which he could not pay. Now when he saw my case, I noted that this Jode, who, if sober, was no fool at all, although he seemed slow and stupid, whispered something to a comrade who was with him, whereon the man turned and fled away like an arrow. From the direction in which he went, I guessed at once that he was running to the barracks close at hand, where were stationed quite three hundred Northmen, all of whom were under my command. The soldiers prepared to obey the Augustus' orders as they were bound to do. They drew their swords, and a number of them advanced towards me slowly. Then it was that Jode, with a few Northmen, moved between them and me, and saluting the Empress, said in his bad Greek, Your pardon, Augusta, but why are we asked to kill our own general? Obey my orders, fellow, she answered. Your pardon, Augusta, said the stolid Jode, but before we kill our own general, whom you commanded us to obey in all things, we would know why we must kill him. It is a custom of our country that no man shall be killed until he has been heard. General Olaf, and drawing his short sword for the first time, he saluted me in form. Be pleased to explain to us why you are to be killed or taken prisoner. Now a tumult arose, and a eunuch in the background shouted to the soldiers to obey the Empress's orders, whereon again some of them began to advance. If no answer is given to my question, went on Jode in his slow, bull-like voice, I fear that others must be killed besides the General Olaf. Ho, Northmen! To me, Northmen! Ho! Britons! To me, Britons! Ho, Saxons! To me, Saxons! Ho, all who are not accursed Greeks! To me, all who are not accursed Greeks! 
now at each cry of jode's men leapt forward from the gathering crowd and to the number of fifty or more in all marshalled themselves behind him those of each nation standing shoulder to shoulder in little groups before me is my question to be answered asked jode because if not although we be but one against ten i think that ere the general olaf is cut down or taken there will be good fighting this night then i spoke saying captain jode and comrades i will answer your question and if i speak wrongly let the augusta correct me this is the trouble the lady heliodore here is my affianced wife we were speaking together in this garden as the affianced do the empress who unseen by us was hidden behind those trees overheard our talk which for reasons best known to herself for in it there was naught of treason or any matter of the state made her so angry that she set her servants on to kill me thinking them murders or robbers i defended myself and there they lie save one who fled away wounded then the empress appeared and ordered me to kill the lady heliodore comrades look on her whom the empress ordered me to kill and say whether were she your affianced would you kill her even to please the empress and stepping to one side i showed them heliodore in all her loveliness standing against the tree the drawn dagger in her hand now from those that jode had summoned there went up a roar of no while even the rest were silent irene sprang forward and cried are my orders to be canvassed and debated obey cut this man down or take him living i care not which and with him all who cling to him or to-morrow you hang every one of you now the soldiers who had gathered also began to form up under their officers for they saw that before them was war and death by this time they were many and as the alarm spread minute by minute more arrived yield or we attack said he who had taken command of them i do not think that we yield answered jode and just then there came a sound of men running in ordered companies from the direction of the northmen's barracks where jode's messenger had told his tale i am sure that we do not yield continued jode and suddenly raised the wild northern war cry valhalla valhalla victory or valhalla instantly from three hundred throats above the sound of the running feet that drew ever nearer came the answering shout of valhalla valhalla victory or valhalla then out of the gloom up dashed the northmen now other shouts arose of olaf 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 where is our general olaf where is red sword here comrades roared jode and up they came those fierce bearded men glad with the lust of battle and ranged themselves by companies before us again the great voice of jode was heard calling empress do you give us olaf and his girl and swear by your christ that no harm shall come to them or must we take them for ourselves never she cried back the only thing i give to you is death on to these rebels soldiers now seeing what must come i strove to speak but jode shouted again be silent olaf for this hour you are not our general you are a prisoner whom it pleases us to rescue ring him round northman ring him round bring the empress too she will serve as hostage now some of them drew behind us then they began to advance taking us along with them and i who was skilled in war saw their purpose they were drawing out into the open glade where they could see to fight and where their flanks would be protected by a stream of water on the one hand and a dense belt of trees on the other in her rage the empress threw herself upon the ground but two great fellows lifted her up by the arms and thrust her along with us marching thus we reached the point that they had chosen for the greeks were in confusion and not ready to attack there we halted just on the crest of a little rise of ground 
augusta i said in the name of god i pray you to give way these northmen hate your byzantines and will take this chance to pay off their scores moreover they love me and will die to a man ere they see me harmed and then how shall i protect you in the fray she only glared at me and made no answer the attack began by this time fifteen hundred or so of the imperial troops had collected and against them stood perhaps four hundred men in all so that the odds were great still they had no horsemen or archers and our position was very good also we were northmen and they were grecian scum on came the byzantines screaming irene irene in a formation of companies ranged one behind the other for their object was to break in our centre by their weight jode saw and gave some orders very good orders i thought them then he sheathed his short sword seized the great battle-axe which was his favourite weapon and placed himself in front of our triple line that waited in dead silence up the slope surged the charge and on the crest of it the battle met at first the weight of the greeks pressed us back but oh they went down before the northmen's steel like corn before the sickle and soon that rush was stayed breast to breast they hewed and thrust and so fearful was the fray that irene forgetting her rage clung to me to protect her the fight hung doubtful as in a dream i watched the giant jode cut down a gorgeous captain the axe shearing through his golden armour as though it were but silk i watched a comrade of my own fall beneath a spear thrust i gazed at the face of heliodore who stared wide-eyed at the red scene and at the white-lipped irene who was clinging to my arm now we were being pressed back again we who at this point had at the most two hundred men some of whom were down to bear the onslaught of twice that number and do what i would my fingers strayed to my sword hilt our triple line bent in like a bow and began to break the scales of war hung upon the turn when from the dense belt of trees upon our left suddenly rose the cry of valhalla valhalla victory or valhalla for which i who had overheard jode's orders was waiting these were his orders that half of the northmen should creep down behind the belt of trees in their dense shadow and thus outflank the foe forth they sprang by companies of fifty the moonlight gleaming on their mail and there three hundred yards away a new battle was begun now the greeks in front of us fearing for their rear wavered a moment and fell back perhaps ten paces i saw the opportunity and could bear no more who before all things was a soldier shouting to some of our wounded to watch the women i drew my sword and leapt forward i come northmen i cried and was greeted with a roar of olaf red sword follow olaf red sword for so the soldiers named me steady northmen shoulder to shoulder northmen i cried back now at them charge valhalla victory or valhalla down the slope they went before our rush in thirty paces they were but a huddled mob on which our swords played like lightnings we rolled them back on to their supports and those supports outflanked began to flee we swept through and through them we slew them by hundreds we trod them beneath our victorious feet and oh in that battle a strange thing happened to me i thought i saw my dead brother ragnar fighting at my side and i i thought i heard him cry to me in that lost remembered voice the old blood runs in you yet you christian man oh you fight well you christian man we of valhalla give you greetings olaf redsword valhalla valhalla victory or valhalla it was done some were fled but more were dead for once at grips the northmen showed no mercy to the greek back we came those who were left of us for many perhaps a hundred were not and formed a ring around the women and the wounded well done olaf said heliodore but irene only looked at me with a kind of wonder in her eyes 
Now the leaders of the Northmen began to talk among themselves, but although from time to time they glanced at me, they did not ask me to join in their talk. Presently Jode came forward and said in his slow voice, Olaf, Red Sword, we love you, who have always loved us, your comrades, as we have shown you tonight. You have led us well, Olaf, and, considering our small numbers, we have just won a victory of which we are proud. But our necks are in the noose, as yours is, and we think that in this case our best course is to be bold. Therefore we name you Caesar. Having defeated the Greeks, we propose now to take the palace and talk with the regiments without, many of whom are disloyal and shout for Constantine, whom after all they hate only a little less than they do Irene yonder. We know not what will be the end of the matter, and do not greatly care who set our fortunes upon a throw of the dice, but we think there is a good chance of victory. Do you accept, and will you throw in your sword with ours? How can I, I answered, when there stands the Empress, whose bread I have eaten, and to whom I have sworn fealty? An Empress, it seems, who desires to slay you over some matter that has to do with a woman. Olaf, the daggers of her assassins have cut this thread of fealty. Moreover, as it chances, she is in our power, and as we cannot make our crime against her blacker than it is, we propose to rid you and ourselves of this empress. Who is our enemy, and who, for her great wickedness, well deserves to die? Such is our offer, to take or to leave, as time is short. Should you refuse it, we abandon you to your fate." and go to make our terms with Constantine, who also hates this empress, and even now is plotting her downfall. As he spoke, I saw certain men draw near to Irene, for a purpose which I could guess, and stepped between her and them. The Augusta is my mistress, I said, and although I attacked some of her troops but now, and she has wronged me much, still I defend her to the last. "'Little use in that, Olaf, seeing that you are but one, and we are many,' answered Jode. "'Come, will you be Caesar, or will you not?' Now Irene crept up behind me and whispered in my ear. "'Accept,' she said. "'It pleases me well. Be Caesar as my husband, so you will save my life and my throne, of which I vow to you an equal share, with the help of your Northmen and the legions I command and who cling to me.' We can defeat Constantine and rule the world together. This petty fray is nothing. What matters it if some lives have been lost in a palace tumult? The world lies in your grasp. Take it, Olaf, and with it, me. I heard and understood. Now had come the great moment of my life. Something told me that on the one hand were majesty and empire, and on the other much pain and sorrow, yet with these a certain holy joy and peace. It was the latter that I chose, as doubtless fate or God had decreed that I should do. I thank you, Augusta, I said, but while I can protect her, I will not seize a throne over the body of one who has been kind to me, nor will I buy it at the price you offer. There stands my predestined wife, and I can marry no other woman. Now Irene turned to Heliodor and said in a swift, low voice, Do you understand this matter, lady? Let us have done with jealousies and be plain, for the lives of all of us hang upon threads that for some must break within a day or two, and with them those of a thousand thousand others. Eh, the destiny of the world is at stake. You say you love this man, whom I will tell you I love also. Well, if you win him and he lives, which he scarce can hope to do. He gets your kisses in whatever corner of the earth will shelter him and you. If I win him, the empire of the earth is his. Moreover, girl, she added with meaning, empresses are not always jealous. Sometimes even they can look the other way. There would be high places for you within our court, and who knows? Your turn might come at length. Also, your father's plans would be forwarded to the last pound of gold in our treasury and the last soldier in our service. 
Within five years, mayhap, he might rule Egypt as our governor. What say you? Heliodore looked at the Empress with that strange, slow smile of hers. Then she looked at me and answered, I say what Olaf says. There are two empires in the case. One which you can give, Augusta, is of the world. The other which I can give him here is only a woman's heart, yet, as I think, of another eternal world that you do not know. I say what Olaf says. Let Olaf speak, Augusta. Empress, I said slowly. Again I thank you, but it may not be. My fate lies here, and I laid my hand upon the heart of Heliodore. You are mistaken, Olaf, answered the Empress in a cold and quiet voice, but seemingly without anger. Your fate lies there, and she pointed to the ground, and then added, Believe me, I am sorry, for you are a man of whom any woman might be proud. Yes, even an Empress. I have always thought it. And I thought it again just now when I saw you lead that charge against those curs in armor. And she pointed towards the bodies of the Greeks. So it is finished, as perchance I am. If I must die, let it be on your sword, Olaf. Your answer, Olaf Redsword, called Jode. You have talked enough. Your answer, yes, your answer, the Northman echoed. The Empress has offered to share her crown with me, Jode, but, friends, it cannot be. Because of this lady to whom I am affianced. Marry them both, shouted a rude voice, but Jode replied. Then that is soon settled. Out of our path, Olaf, and look the other way. When you turn your head again, there will be no Empress to trouble you, except one of your own choosing. On hearing these words and seeing the swords draw near, Irene clutched hold of me, for always she feared death above everything. You will not see me butchered, she gasped. Not while I live, I answered. Hearken, friends. I am the general of the Augustus guard, and if she dies, for honor's sake, I must die first. Strike then, if you will, but through my body. Tear her away! called a voice. Comrades, I went on, be not so mad. Tonight we have done that which has earned us death. But while the Empress lives, you have a hostage in your hands with whom you can buy pardon. As a lump of clay, what worth is she to you? Hark, the regiment's from the city. As I spoke, from the direction of the palace came a sound of many voices and of the tread of five thousand feet. True enough, said Jode with composure. They are on us, and now it is too late to storm the palace. Olaf, like many other men, you have lost your chance of glory for a woman. Or who knows, perhaps you've won it. Well, comrades, as I take it, you are not minded to fly and be hunted down like rats. Only one thing remains. To die in a fashion they will remember in Byzantium. Olaf, you'd best mind the women. I will take command. Ring round, comrades. Ring round. Tis a good place for it. Set the wounded in the middle. Keep that empress living for the present, but when all is done, kill her. We'll be her escort to the gates of hell, for there she's bound if ever a woman was. Then, without murmur or complaint, almost in silence, indeed, they formed Odin's ring that triple circle of the Northmen doomed to die, that terrible circle that on many a battlefield has been hidden at last beneath the heap of fallen foes. The regiments moved up. There were three of them of full strength. Irene stared about her, seeking some loophole of escape, and finding none. Heliodore and I talked together in low tones, making our tryst beyond the grave. The regiments halted within fifty paces of us. They liked not the look of Odin's ring, and the ground over which they had marched, and the fugitives with whom they had spoken told them that many of them looked their last upon the moon. Some mounted generals rode towards us and asked who was in command of the Northmen. 
when they learned that it was jod they invited him to a parley the end of it was that jod and two others stepped twenty paces from our ranks and met a counsellor it was staratius and two of the generals in the open where no treachery could well be practised especially as staratius was not a man of war here they talked together for a long while then jode and his companions returned and jode said so that all might hear him hearken these are the terms offered that we return to our barracks in peace bearing our weapons that nothing be laid to our charge under any law military or civil by the state or private persons for this night's slaying and tumult and that in guarantee thereof twelve hostages of high rank upon whose names we have agreed be given into our keeping that we retain our separate stations in the service of the empire or have leave to quit that service within three months with the gratuity of a quarter's pay and go where we will unmolested but that in return for these boons we surrender the person of the empress unharmed and with her that of the general olaf to whom a fair trial is promised before a military court that with her own voice the augusta shall confirm all these undertakings before she leaves our ranks such is the offer comrades and if we refuse it what asked a voice this that we shall be ringed round and either starved out or shot down by archers or if we try to escape that we shall be overwhelmed by numbers and any of us who chance to be taken living shall be hanged sound and wounded together now the leaders of the northmen consulted irene watched them for a while then turned to me and asked what will they do olaf i cannot say augusta i answered but i think that they will offer to surrender you and not myself since they may doubt them of that fair trial which is promised to me which means she said that whether i live or die all these brave men will be sacrificed to you olaf who after all must perish with them as will this egyptian are you prepared to accept that blood offering olaf if so you must have changed from the man i loved no augusta i answered i am not prepared rather would i trust myself into your power augusta the conference of the officers had come to an end their leaders advanced and said we accept the terms except as to the matter of olaf redsword the empress may go free but olaf redsword our general whom we love we will not surrender first will we die good said jode i looked for such words from you then he marched out with his companions and again met Staratius and the two generals of the Greeks. After they had talked a little while, he returned and said, These two officers, being men, would have agreed, but Staratius, the eunuch, who seems in command, will not agree. He says that Olaf Redsword must be surrendered with the Empress. We answered that in this case soon there would be no Empress to surrender, except one ready for burial. He replied that was as God might decree. Either both must be surrendered, or both be held. Do you know why the dog said that, whispered Irene to me? It was because these Northmen have let slip the offer I made to you but now. And he is jealous of you, and fears you may take his power. Well, if I live, one day he shall pay for this who cares so little for my life. So she spoke, but I made no answer. Instead, I turned to Heliodor, saying, You see how matters stand, beloved. Either I must surrender myself, or all these brave men must perish, and we with them. For myself I am ready to die, but I am not willing that you and they should die. Also, if I yield, I can do no worse than die. Whereas, perchance, after all things, will take another turn. Now what say you? i say follow your heart olaf she replied steadily honor comes first of all the rest is with god wherever you go there i soon shall be 
I thank you. I answered, your mind is mine. Then I stepped forward and said, Comrades, it is my turn to throw in this great game. I have heard and considered all, and I think it best that I should be surrendered with the Augusta to the Greeks. We will not surrender you, they shouted. Comrades, I am still your general, and my order is that you surrender me. Also, I have other orders to give to you, that you guard this lady Heliodor to the last, and that while one of you remains alive, she shall be to you as though she were that man's daughter or mother or sister to help and protect as best he may in every circumstance, seen or unforeseen. Further, that with her you guard her father, the noble Egyptian Magus. Will you promise this to me? Aye, they roared in answer. You hear them, Heliodor, I said. Know that henceforth you are one of a large family, and however great your enemies, that you will never lack a friend. Comrades, I went on, this is my second order, and perchance the last that I shall ever give to you. Unless you hear that I am evilly treated in the palace yonder, stay quiet. But if that tidings should reach you, then all oaths are broken. Do what you can and will. Aye, they roared again. Afterwards, what happened? It comes back to me, but dimly. I think they swore the Empress on the blood of Christ that I should go unharmed. I think I embraced Heliodor before them all and gave her into their keeping. I think I whispered into the ear of Jode to seek out the Bishop Barnabas and pray him to get her and her father away to Egypt without delay, yes, even by force, if it were needful. Then I think I left their lines, and that, as I went, leading the Augusta by the hand, they gave to me the general's salute. That I turned and saluted them in answer, ere I yielded myself into the power of my godfather, Staratius, who greeted me with a false and sickly smile. End of chapter 7 Book Two, Chapter Eight of the Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, The Trial of Olaf. I know not what time went by before I was put upon my trial, but that trial I can still see as clearly as though it were happening before my eyes. It took place in a long, low room of the vast palace buildings that was lighted only by window places set high up in the wall. These walls were frescoed, and at the end of the room, above the seat of the judges, was a rude picture in bright colors of the condemnation of Christ by Pilate. Pilate, I remember, was represented with a black face, to signify his wickedness, I suppose, and in the air above him hung a red-eyed imp shaped like a bat who gripped his robe with one claw and whispered into his ear. There were seven judges, he who presided being a law officer and the other six captains of different grades, chosen mostly from among the survivors of those troops whom the Northmen had defeated on the night of the battle in the palace gardens. As this was a military trial, I was allowed no advocate to defend me, nor indeed did I ask for any. The court, however, was open and crowded with spectators, among whom I saw most of the great officers of the palace, Staratius with them, also some ladies, one of whom was Martina, my godmother. The back of the long room was packed with soldiers and others, not all of whom were my enemies. Into this place I was brought, guarded by four negroes, great fellows armed with swords, whom I knew to be chosen out of the number of the executioners of the palace and the city. Indeed, one of them had served under me when I was governor of the state prison, and been dismissed by me because of some cruelty which he had practiced. Noting all these things, and the pity in Martina's eyes, I knew that I was already doomed. But as I had expected nothing else, 
this did not trouble me over much i stood before the judges and they stared at me why do you not salute us fellow asked one of them a mincing greek captain whom i had seen running like a hare upon the night of the fray because captain i am of senior rank to any whom i see before me and as yet uncondemned therefore if salutes are in question it is you who should salute me at this speech they stared at me still harder than before but among the soldiers at the end of the hall there arose something like a murmur of applause waste no time in listening to his insolence said the president of the court clerk set out the case then a black-robed man who sat beneath the judges rose and read the charge to me from a parchment it was brief and to the effect that i michael formerly known as olaf or olaf red sword a northman in the service of the empress irene a general in her armies a chamberlain and master of the palace had conspired against the empress had killed her servants had detained her person threatened to murder her had made war upon her troops and slain some hundreds of them by the help of other northmen and wounded many more i was asked what i pleaded to this charge and replied i am not guilty then witnesses were called the first of these was the fourth man whom irene had set upon me who alone escaped with a wound behind this fellow having been carried into court for he could not walk leaned over a bar for he could not sit down and told his story when he had finished i was allowed to examine him why did the empress order you and your companions to attack me i asked i think because she saw you kiss the egyptian lady general at which answer many laughed you tried to kill me did you not yes general for the empress ordered us to do so then what happened you killed or cut down three of us one after the other general being too skilful and strong for us as i turned to fly you wounded me here and dragging himself round with difficulty he showed how my sword had fallen on a part where no soldier should receive a wound at the sight those in the court laughed again did i provoke you in any way before you attacked me no indeed general it was the empress you provoked by kissing the beautiful egyptian lady at least i think so since every time you kissed each other she seemed to become more mad and at last ordered us to kill both of you now the laughter grew very loud for even the court officers could no longer restrain themselves and the ladies hid their faces in their hands and tittered away with that fool shouted the president of the court and the poor fellow was hustled out what became of him afterwards i do not know though i can guess now appeared witness after witness who told of the fray which i have described already though for the most part they tried to put another colour on the matter of many of these men i asked no questions indeed growing weary of their tales i said at length to the judges sirs what need is there for all this evidence seeing that among you i perceive three gallant officers whom i saw running before the northmen that night when with some four hundred swords we routed about two thousand of you you yourselves therefore are the best witnesses of what befell moreover i acknowledge that being moved by the sight of war in the end i led the charge against you before which charge some died and many fled you among them now these captains glowered at me and the president said the prisoner is right what need is there of more evidence i think much sir i answered since but one side of the story has been heard now i will call witnesses of whom the first should be the augusta if she is willing to appear and tell you what happened within the circle of the northmen on that night call the augusta gasped the president perchance prisoner michael you will wish next to call god himself on your behalf that sir i answered 
I have already done and do. Moreover, I added slowly, of this I am sure, that in a time to come, although it be not to-morrow nor the next day, you and everyone who has to do with this case will find that I have not called him in vain. At these words, for a few moments, a solemn silence fell upon the court. It was as though they had gone home to the heart of everyone who was present there. Also, I saw the curtains that draped a gallery high up on the wall shake a little. It came into my mind that Irene herself was hidden behind those curtains, as afterwards I learned was the case, and that she had made some movement which caused them to tremble. Well, said the President, after this pause, as God does not appear to be your witness, and as you have no other, seeing that you cannot give evidence yourself under law, we will now proceed to judgment. Who says that the General Olaf, Olaf Redsword, has no witness? exclaimed a deep voice at the end of the hall. I am here to be his witness. Who speaks? asked the President. Let him come forward. There was a disturbance at the end of the hall, and through the crowd that he seemed to throw before him to right and left appeared the mighty form of Jode. He was clad in full armor and bore his famous battle-axe in his hand. One whom some of you know well enough, as others of your company who will never know anything again have done in the past. One named Jode, the Northman, second in command of the guard to the General Olaf, he answered, and marched to the spot where witnesses were accustomed to stand. Take away that barbarian's axe! exclaimed an officer who sat among the judges ay said jode come hither mannikin and take it away if you can i promise you that along with it something else shall be taken away to wit your fool's head who are you that would dare to disarm an officer of the imperial guard after this there was no more talk of removing jode's axe and he proceeded to give his evidence which as it only detailed what has been written already need not be repeated what effect it produced upon the judges i cannot say but that it moved those present in the court was clear enough have you done asked the president at length when the story was finished not altogether said jode olaf redsword was promised an open trial and that he has since otherwise i and some friends of mine could not be in this court to tell the truth, where perhaps the truth has seldom been heard before. Also he was promised a fair trial, and that he has not, seeing that the most of his judges are men with whom he fought the other day, and who only escaped his sword by flight. Tomorrow I propose to ask the people of Byzantium whether it is right that a man should be tried by his conquered enemies, now i perceive that you will find a verdict of guilty against olaf redsword and perhaps condemn him to death well find what verdict you will and pass what sentence you will but do not dare to attempt to execute that sentence dare dare shouted the president who are you man who would dictate to a court appointed by the empress what it shall and shall not do be careful lest we pass sentence on you as well as on your fellow traitor. Remember where you stand, and that if I lift my finger you will be taken and bound. I, lawyer, I remember this and other things. For instance, that I have the safe conduct of the Empress under an oath sworn on the cross of the Christ she worships. For instance, also, that I have three hundred comrades waiting my safe return. Three hundred, snarled the president. The empress has three thousand within these walls, who will soon make an end of your three hundred. I have been told, lawyer, answered Jode, that once there lived another monarch, one called Xerxes, who thought that he would make an end of a certain three hundred Greeks, when Greeks were different from what you are today, at a place called Thermopylae. He made an end of them, but they cost him more than he cared to pay, and now it is those Greeks who live for ever, and Xerxes who is dead. 
but that's not all since that fray the other night we northmen have found friends have you heard of the armenian legions president those who favor constantine well kill olaf redsword or kill me jode and you have to deal first with the northmen and next with the armenian legions now here i am waiting to be taken by any who can pass this axe at these words a great silence fell upon the court jode glared about him and seeing that none ventured to draw near stepped from the witness place advanced to where i was gave me the full salute of ceremony then marched away to the back of the court the crowd opening a path for him when he had gone the judges began to consult together and as i expected very soon agreed upon their verdict the president said or rather gabbled prisoner we find you guilty have you any reason to offer why sentence of death should not be passed upon you sir i answered i am not here to plead for my life which already i have risked a score of times in the service of your people yet i would say this on the night of the outbreak i was set on four to one for no crime as you have heard and did but protect myself afterwards when i was about to be slain the northmen my comrades protected me unasked then i did my best to save the life of the empress and in fact succeeded my only offence is that when the great charge took place and your regiments were defeated remembering only that i was a soldier i led that charge if this is a crime worthy of death i am ready to die yet i hold that both god and man will give more honour to me the criminal than to you the judges and to those who before ever you sat in this court instructed you whom i know to be but tools as to the verdict that you should give the applause which my words called forth from those gathered at the end of the court died away in the midst of a great silence the president who like his companions i could see well was growing somewhat fearful read the sentence in a low voice from a parchment after setting out the order by which the court was constituted and other matters it ran we condemn you michael otherwise called olaf or olaf red sword to death this sentence will be executed with or without torture at such time and in such manner as it may please the augusta to decree now the voice of jode was heard crying through the gathering gloom for night was near what sort of judgment is this that the judges bring already written down into the court hearken you lawyer and you street curs his companions who call yourselves soldiers if olaf redsword dies those hostages whom we hold die also if he is tortured those hostages will be tortured also moreover ere long we will sack this fine place and what has befallen olaf shall befall you also you false judges neither less nor more remember it all you who shall have charge of olaf in his bonds and if she be within hearing let the augusta irene remember it also lest another time there should be no olaf to save her life now i could see that the judges were terrified hastily with white faces they consulted together as to whether they should order jode to be seized presently i heard the president say to his companion nay best let him go if he is touched our hostages will die moreover doubtless constantine and the armenians are at the back of him or he would not dare to speak thus would that we were clear of this business which has been thrust upon us then he called aloud let the prisoner be removed down the long court i was marched only now guards who had been called in went in front and behind me and with them the four executioners by whom i was surrounded farewell godmother i whispered to martina as i passed nay not farewell she whispered back looking up at me with eyes that were full of tears though what she meant i did not know 
at the end of the court where those who dared to sympathize with me openly were gathered rough voices called blessings on me and rough hands patted me on the shoulder to one of these men whose voice i recognized in the gloom i turned to speak a word thereon the black executioner who was between us he whom i had dismissed from the jail for cruelty struck me on the mouth with the back of his hand next instant i heard a sound that reminded me of the growl the white bear gave when it gripped steinar two arms shot out and caught that black savage by the head there was a noise as of something breaking and down went the man a corpse then they hurried me away for now it was not only the judges who were afraid it comes to me that for some days three or four i sat in my cell at the palace for here i was kept because as i learned afterwards it was feared that if i were removed to that state prison of which i had been governor some attempt would be made to rescue me this cell was one of several situated beneath that broad terrace which looked out on to the sea where irene had first questioned me as to the shell necklace and against my prayer had set it upon her own breast it had a little barred window out of which i could watch the sea and through this window came the sound of sentries tramping overhead and of the voice of the officer who at stated hours arrived to turn out the guard as for some years it had been my duty to do i wondered who that officer might be and wondered also how many of such men since byzantium became the capital of the empire had filled this office and mine and what had become of them all as i knew if that terrace had been able to speak it could have told many bloody stories whereof doubtless mine would be another doubtless too there would be more to follow until the end came whatever that might be in that straight place i reflected on many things all my youth came back to me i marvelled what had happened at r since i left it such long years ago once or twice rumours had reached me from men in my company who were danish born that aduna was a great lady there and still unmarried but of fredisa i had heard nothing probably she was dead and if so i felt sure that her fierce and faithful spirit must be near me now as that of ragnar had seemed to be in the battle of the garden how strange it was that after all my vision had been fulfilled and it had been my lot to meet her of whom i had dreamed wearing that necklace of which i had found one half upon the wanderer in his grave mound were i and the wanderer the same spirit i asked of myself and she of the dream and heliodore the same woman who could tell at least this was sure from the moment that we first saw one another we knew we belonged each to each for the present and the future therefore as it was with these we had to do the past might sleep and all its secrets now we had met but to be parted again by death which seemed hard indeed yet since we had met for my part fate had my forgiveness for i knew that we should meet again i looked back on what i had done and left undone and could not blame myself overmuch true it would have been wiser if i had stayed by irene and heliodore and not led that charge against the greeks only then as a soldier i should never have forgiven myself for how could i stand still while my comrades fought for me no no i was glad i had led the charge and led it well though my life must pay its price nor was this so i must die not because i had lifted sword against irene's troops but for the sin of loving heliodore after all what was life as we knew it a passing breath well as the body breathes many million times between the cradle and the grave so i believed the soul must breathe out its countless lives each ending in a form of death and beyond these what i did not know yet my new-found faith gave me much comfort in such meditations and in sleep i passed my hours waiting always until the door of my cell should open 
and through it appear not the jailer with my food, which I noted was plentiful and delicate, but the executioners, or mayhap the tormentors. At length it did open, somewhat late at night, just as I was about to lay myself down to rest, and through it came a veiled woman. I bowed and motioned to my visitor to be seated on the stool that was in the cell, then waited in silence. Presently she threw off her veil, and in the light of the lamp showed that I stood before the Empress Irene. Olaf, she said hoarsely, I am come here to save you from yourself, if it may be so. I was hidden in yonder court, and heard all that passed at your trial. I guessed as much, Augusta, I said, but what of it? For one thing this, the coward and fool, who is now dead of his wounds, who gave evidence as to the killing of the three other cowards by you, has caused my name to become a mock through Constantinople. Ay, the vilest make songs upon me in the streets, such songs as I cannot repeat. I am grieved, Augusta, I said. It is I who should grieve, not you, who are told of as a man who grew weary of the love of an empress and cast her off as though she were a tavern wench. That is the first matter. The second is that under the finding of the court of justice... Oh, Augusta, I interrupted. Why stain your lips with those words of justice? Under the finding of the court, she went on, your fate is left in my hands. I may kill you or torment your body or I may spare you and raise your head higher than any other in the empire. I and adorn it with a crown. Doubtless you may do any of these things, Augusta, but which of them do you wish to do? All of notwithstanding all that has gone, I would still do the last. I speak to you no more of love or tenderness, nor do I pretend that this is for your sake alone. It is for mine also. My name is smirched, and only marriage can cover up the stain upon it. Moreover, I am beset by troubles and by dangers. Those accursed Northmen who you love so well and who fight, not like men but like devils, are in league with the Armenian legions and with Constantine. My generals and my troops fall away from me. If it were assailed, I am not sure that I could hold this palace, strong though it be. There's but one man who can make me safe again, and that man is yourself. The Northmen will do your bidding, and with you in command of them, I fear no attack. You have the honesty, the wit, and the soldier's skill and courage. You must command, or none. Only this time it must not be as Irene's lover, for that is what they name you, but as her husband. A priest is waiting within call, and one of high degree. Within an hour, Olaf, you may be my consort, and within a year, the emperor of the world. Oh, she went on with passion, can you not forgive what seem to be my sins when you remember that they were wrought for the love of you? Augusta, I said, I have small ambition. I am not minded to be an emperor. But hearken, put aside this thought of marriage with one so far beneath you, and let me marry her whom I have chosen, and who has chosen me. Then once more I'll take command of the Northmen, and defend you and your cause to the last drop of my blood. Her face hardened. It may not be, she said. Not only for those reasons I have told you, but for another which I grieve to have to tell. Heliodor, daughter of Magus the Egyptian, is dead. Dead? I gasped. Dead? I, Olaf, dead. You did not see, and she, being a brave woman, hid it from you. But one of those spears that were flung in the fight struck her in the side. For a while the wound went well, but two days ago... It mortified. Last night she died, and this morning I myself saw her buried with honor. How did you see her buried, you who were not welcome among the Northmen? I asked. By my order, as her blood was high, 
she was laid in the palace graveyard olaf did she leave me no word or token augusta she swore to me that if she died she would send me the other half of that necklace which i wear i have heard of none said irene but you will know olaf that i have other business to attend to just now than such deathbed gossip these things do not come to my ears i looked at irene and irene looked at me augusta i said i do not believe your story no spear wounded heliodore while i was near her and when i was not near her your greeks were too far away for any spears to be thrown indeed unless you stabbed her secretly she was not wounded and i am sure that however much you have hated her this you would not have dared to do for your own life's sake augusta for your own purposes you are trying to deceive me i will not marry you do your worst you have lied to me about the woman whom i love and though i forgive you all the rest this i do not forgive you know well that heliodore still lives beneath the sun if so answered the empress you have looked your last upon the sun and her never again shall you behold the beauty of heliodore have you aught to say there is still time nothing augusta at present except this of late i have learned to believe in a god i summon you to meet me before that god there we will argue out our case and abide his judgment if there is no god there will be no judgment and i salute you empress who triumph if as i believe and as you say you believe there is a god think whom you will be called upon to salute when that god has heard the truth meanwhile i repeat that heliodore the egyptian still lives beneath the sun irene rose from the stool on which she sat and thought a moment i gazed through the bars of the window place in my cell out at the night above the young moon was floating in the sky and near to it hung a star a little passing cloud with a dented edge drifted over the star and the lower horn of the moon it went by and they shone out again upon the background of the blue heavens also an owl flitted across the window place of my cell it had a mouse in its beak and the shadow of it and of the writhing mouse for a moment lay upon irene's breast for i turned my head and saw them it came into my mind that there was an allegory irene was the night hawk and i was the writhing mouse that fed its appetite Doubtless it was decreed that the owl must be and the mouse must be. But beyond them both, hidden in those blue heavens, stood that justice which we call God. These were the last things that I saw in this life of mine, and therefore I remember them well, or rather almost the last. The very last of which I took note was Irene's face. It had grown like to that of a devil, the great eyes in it stared out between the puffed and purple eyelids. The painted cheeks had sunk in and were pallid beneath and round the paint. The teeth showed in two white lines. The chin worked. She was no longer a beautiful woman. She was a fiend. Irene knocked thrice upon the door. Bolts were thrown back and men entered blind him she said end of chapter eight